Welcome to episode nine of season two of Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with History Today, the world's leading serious history magazine. Peter Moore. Today we're going to go back to the high middle ages to see a remarkable matriarch operating with skill and speed in a ruthless dynastic world. In the 1190s Richard of Devizes wrote to Eleanor of Aquitaine that she was a matchless woman, beautiful yet chaste, powerful and modest, meek yet eloquent, qualities that are most rarely found in a woman. She was advanced in years enough to have had two husbands and two sons crowned king, still indefatigable in every undertaking, whose power was the admiration of her age. OK, so how close was this description to the reality of her time? To answer that question today, we have the author of a new biography of Eleanor of Aquitaine, Sarah Cockrell. Sarah studied law at St Anne's College in Oxford and she was called to the bar in 1990. She's now one of the Queen's Bench Division judges by day and a historical biographer when she gets the chance. In 2014, her biography of Eleanor of Castile, the first wife of King Edward I, was published and now she's back with another book and another Eleanor. Eleanor of Aquitaine, Queen of France and England, Mother of Empires, was published last month and I caught up with Sarah just by the courts in London, I suppose, the other day to talk about one year in Eleanor's story. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome to Travels Free Time, Sarah. Thank you. Well, for my first question, I just want to go back to one of our earlier episodes and say that we caught a glimpse of this intriguing character, Eleanor of Aquitaine, right at the beginning of this season when Dan Jones pictured her I think it was in Paris. It was in the year 1147. She's poised to set off on the Second Crusade. Back then, she was married to Louis VII of France. And he, of course, hinted that there was much more to come from her. We're going to talk about all of this in a moment. But I thought it might be good if we began with you telling us a little bit about Eleanor's early life. Well, I'll do my best. Okay. Um, Eleanor's early life is a slightly elusive topic. We don't know when she was born, and a variety of dates have been suggested. 1122 is one, 1124 is the one that I've preferred. But we really have to rely on much later materials to even infer the date of her birth. She's the daughter of William of Aquitaine, Duke of Aquitaine, Count of Poitou, also Duke of Gascony. Her family rules a large portion of southwestern France. Uh, They're a very powerful family. They marry into, for example, the Castilian and Aragonese royal families. She is orphaned quite young. Her mother died when she was about six. Her father, when she was, depending on which birth date you choose, about 13. And because her younger brother had already died, she became the heir to Aquitaine and thus an immensely valuable marital prize. So she had to be married pretty fast or somebody would simply steal her. Nick Vincent described Eleanor as a walking title deed and this was something which was to haunt her actually throughout her life. And so the first person to ensure that she got taken off the market was the wily Louis VI of France, the King of France at the time, who got together with Eleanor's guardian, the Archbishop of Bordeaux, and arranged her marriage to his son and heir, the future Louis VII of France. Okay, so it's an interesting description and one that sticks in the memory, uh, a walking title deed. Let's think about um, Aquitaine for a moment, just do a bit mm. of the geopolitical history so we can put in listeners' minds this picture of what we think of as modern day France. What was it like back in the 12th century and where was Aquitaine? Aquitaine was a different place at different times because it had been essentially a segment of the Roman Empire. There was Gallia Aquitania as one of the three segments of the the French portion of the Roman Empire. Uh, You then have it dividing under the Franks 
So Aquitaine itself became the portion around Bordeaux, essentially. You then have Gascony slightly further across and south towards the Pyrenees. Aquitaine then moves up and borders onto Eleanor's other lands in Poitou. Poitou, of course, is near Poitiers, um, so almost central France. So Eleanor's lands had a huge reach from lands which are traditionally thought of as the Languedoc, where people didn't say oui for yes, they said oc, up to territories which we think of as more traditionally northern. She bordered on Anjou um, and a number of those territories. So, so these are, I so imagine, this is wine-growing territory. This is very much abundant so. in natural resources. And I suppose south of the Loire, which is the river which takes you straight out into mm. the Atlantic and then, well, wherever you really want to go, as far as you want to go. So how unusual a character was Eleanor at this time? I think let's try not to look at history too much from our position backwards and, and place her as a, a young woman in the first half of the 12th century. It seems that she came into this inheritance after a... Um, the circumstances of deaths and so on. But she had real power, didn't she? Well, she had lands which were equivalent to real power. Did she exercise real power in her first marriage? I think it's highly dubious, and I'm not alone in thinking that. There is very little evidence of her exercising real power in her first marriage. The charters that she issues while she's married to Louis VII are basically just confirmations of what he's doing. There is very little evidence of her leading any any initiatives. Even the traditional story that she provoked, persuaded, charmed Louis into trying to conquer Toulouse, there's no real evidence for that. Toulouse was a very tempting target for him for all sorts of other reasons. One point where Eleanor does come to the fore is on crusade, she does tell Louis she wants out of the marriage and he effectively abducts her because he was not going to let her have that freedom of determination. They then have one more child, but because it's a, a girl and he needs a male heir, he is finally persuaded that they ought to call time on the marriage and it is officially annulled, but since- On the grounds of consanguinity. On the grounds of consanguinity, but ironically, the real reason as far as he was concerned was that she was deemed unable to provide male children. Yeah, but this walking title deed is still walking and she oh, walks yes. next into the arms of Henry, who soon to become the King of England, and thus begins that great association between her and the English, yes. which um, spans the next half a century or so. And um, there's almost too much, isn't there, to delve into in any detail. So I wonder how fruitless it is for us to try. But I think suffice to say that she has numerous children with Henry. Including plenty of sons. Including plenty of sons, which will cause trouble later on. So you can bear that in the back of your mind. She joins a rebellion against her husband, um, after which she's then put under arrest yes. um, for a prolonged period of time, about 15 years. Yes, but um, for, to a greater or lesser extent, she is effectively under lock and key for 15 years. Until his death Yes. in, what's that, 1189? Absolutely. And then she emerges into the part of her life, which um, we're going to analyse in a bit more detail now. But, but I also want to say that she becomes, I, I suppose maybe it is because she's a slightly unusual figure in one sense, a very powerful woman. You might argue against that. Mm. But there's a great mythology which is already beginning around this time, which is in later centuries built on enormously to create the distortions of the picture of Eleanor that we have today. Is that right? Yes. I think, you know, Eleanor has some great building blocks for mythology. I mean, how many women have there ever been who've been Queen of France and Queen of England? Um, she does do some slightly unusual things, like asking her first husband for a divorce, like standing up to Bernard of Clairvaux, like joining with her children in their rebellion. So she gives the great building blocks, but it is this later period after she emerges from, again, the unusual thing of being in prison for 15 years. And she exercises great power in very high profile situations that sort of creates the alchemy, which then leads to the myth 
of Eleanor, which has sort of echoed down the years. Should since. we imagine that as, as already gaining any traction in, say, 1189, when Henry dies? This picture of a woman who's against nature, in a way, who rebels against her husband, who has these affairs with people that she really shouldn't. One of the stories we know later on, the famous one, is of her having some physical relationship with Saladin, for example. We know these to be quite silly now. Yes. But did they have any currency at that time? Well, of course, throughout the period when she's in prison, um, Henry actually wanted to divorce her. And Henry's tame authors wrote a number of highly coloured versions of the story of the Crusades and so forth, which did give currency to those myths. So even after Eleanor emerges and becomes a more orthodox, powerful figure, the echoes of the more controversial aspects of her earlier life are there and do get mentioned. They then slightly get put in the background while she is acting in a way which people approve of, and then they get blown up in the 13th century and thereafter. So this 1190s period is to me fascinating because we see her operating on a very high level, she's full of energy, she's full of ambition, and she, in a, in a way, seems to be the person who's moving the pieces around the chessboard. Mm. We see her as a major force in politics, and she's acting as regent, really, whilst her son, who's the successor to Henry, Richard, Richard de Lionheart, of course, he's absent on crusade, and she's mm. picking up a lot of the day-to-day -day business, isn't she? But she's sorting out manners, she's sorting out abbeys, she's sorting out marriages. She then goes and raises the ransom for Richard. Mm. And we're actually in general election mode now in 2019, but if we think back to then, it seems that she would have been quite a good campaigner in the 1190s, because she's all over the place. One Absolutely. moment she's in Portsmouth, then she's in Ely, I think you have her at one moment. Then she's back in France. And then I think she goes to Rome as well. So she, yes. she covers enormous distances. So she must have been a very physically strong person as well. At the point where she emerges in 1189, it could have gone either way. She could have gone straight into retirement or she could have asserted herself. And she was plainly fit enough and full enough of energy and Richard's needs dictated that she had to take the step forward. And she must have, she must have been in phenomenally good physical health to... Yeah to do the things she did. So what age would she be by now if we do a bit of mathematics? She'd be in her 60s, wouldn't she? Yes, yeah, so on her emergence from prison, she is a, she's about 65. Well, in an age when there were so many ways to die very quickly from, I mean, not just mm. in, in the slightly dramatic ways that we might associate with crusading or battles or pillaging or whatever, there's plenty of diseases that could get you mm. earlier and your body could just crumble. She seems to be if anything, getting a bit stronger at this point, yes. like released from prison and um, on the march. Absolutely. I mean, I in modern terms, I think of her as an icon of returnships yeah. for, for women who've, you know, had their children, have maybe been, um, you know, stuck at home with the domestic focus for many years and who, you know, here she is. She just puts it all behind her, brings into effect all the knowledge that she's gained over the various roles that she's performed over the years and performs actually to a much higher level than she had ever done before. Wow. That's a, that's a nice way of framing this, actually, because we could, in our society today, I know they talk about women in their 40s coming back to the workforce are often the most productive members of a mm. workforce. So maybe that we could have some Eleanor of Aquitaine schemes today in various com Quite. companies to encourage them along all the more. OK, so um, I think we've done, <laughs> we've done a pretty good job of filling in what is essentially 65 years of complex life mm. at um, the top of um, would it be anachronistic to say European politics? I, I'll, I'll go I know, with that. I think, I think that's good. We'll go with that. So let's go to your first scene. We're going to look at the year 1199. Yes. Right at the end of that very full century of history. And um, the first scene you picked is Richard I's deathbed. This happens in... When about does this happen? So it happens end of March, beginning of April, end of 11... March. 1199. Well, I'll let you pick up at this point. Can you tell us what's going on? Okay, so by this point, as far as Eleanor's concerned, having um, seen Richard through his crusading years, his capture, his ransom and so forth, she had finally uh, done a bit of a retirement to the Abbey of Fontrevaux. 
uh, which was on the border of her lands and the Angevin lands. So um, it was a place that she and Henry II had, had long association with. And Richard was governing the empire. And he was, as always, having trouble with some of Eleanor's vassals, who never took kindly to her husband's, frankly. Um, and in particular, he was at a place called Chalou, and he, I'm afraid, took an arrow in the shoulder after having gone out to see what was going on in a slightly courageous, foolhardy fashion without, with insufficient armour. And after a couple of days, it became apparent that he was not going to rally from this terrible injury. Um, he had got gangrene, he was confined to bed, and the thing that he immediately did was to send for his mother. Now, it seems perfectly conventional. Fine, send for your mum. His mother was 75 years old and she was 180 kilometres away. There was no train, there was no plane. She had to, he had to send swift gallopers and she then had to, at that age, make a very swift journey to Shallow, which she did. Uh, and so again, we were talking about her physical resilience um, there's another example, now 75, managing that terrible journey at top speed. She then arrives at the deathbed. Richard has not bothered to summon his wife, Berengaria, and she is there at the point when he dies. It's tremendously vivid, isn't it? Because we get these two huge characters of this period, Richard de Lionheart, the great crusader, and um, Eleanor, his mother. And... It's often talked about, maybe you could add a bit more to this, but uh, he was apparently her favourite child. Is that right? Or is that just... I'm effort? pretty dubious about that, actually. I, I'm prepared to bet that he was probably her favourite son. And certainly the way he wrote to her from captivity, he, he wrote a beautiful letter when he was trying to get her to assist with the election of the Archbishop of Canterbury with the words, dearest mother, repeated over and over again, sweetest mother. And uh, the terms in which she then wrote about him after his death in her charters um, do indicate a strong bond. But I think she was probably actually as close to her daughters, who she had more of the raising of. But the evidence is a bit difficult on, on that. But certainly she was very close to Richard. She'd spent time in between 1168 and 1173 effectively teaching him to govern in Poitou. So he learned a lot from her and he turned to her when he became king. He wanted her to run essentially the empire while he was away on crusade. He turned to her when he needed his ransom raising, which she did. He turned to her when he needed a decision about whether to give homage to the Emperor Henry VI as a condition of being released. And he turned to her at that very last moment. She was the only person he wanted by his side. So that's very significant. We have this chronicler who is actually in the tent and he mentions the whole deathbed scene and the arrival of Eleanor. Then also after the death of Richard, when Eleanor takes his body back to Fontreveau, she enters into a lot of charters and she actually gives a charter which says, know that I was with him at his death. So that's the so key line, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, from her own mouth. From her own mouth. So yes. this is watertight source, really, from that period. Yeah. Wow, that's striking. The question I have for you regarding this scene is, well, we said before, it's significant that he calls for her and not his wife. What do you think they might have discussed at this point? Well, I'm fairly clear that they would have discussed who was to be his heir. Uh, they may well have discussed what was to be done financially for his wife, but it would have been primarily determining what was to happen to the lands. Mm. Um, there was actually quite a, an array of people who were possible heirs. Richard had actually groomed one of Eleanor's grandsons by her daughter Matilda, Otto, uh, to be his heir. Uh, he had governed Poitou for quite a long time. He had been lined up to marry somebody um, to make him an acceptable heir in England. But he had gone off to campaign to be emperor. So he had disappeared out of the equation. There would have been a question about whether he could be summoned back. There was John, Richard's slightly controversial younger brother. There was Arthur of Brittany. That's the son of her son, Geoffrey, by Constance of Brittany. And at one point, Richard had declared him the heir. Mm. 
I think you write at some point that um, hindsight suggests that John's succession was inevitable. However, this was really not so. And I think it just tells us so much, doesn't it? That, okay, you've got the this kind of tragedy drama of the arrow and it almost becomes a bit of a ticking clock, doesn't it? Because this is gangrene that's going to kill mm-hmm. him. It must be apparent very quickly. And um, whether that could have been ameliorated in any way, I don't know. Probably not. He knew that he was mortally ill and he had a very short period of time. Who do you call? You call the fixer almost. Mm. And this seems to be the role that Ellen is playing at this moment. She is, of course, she's the mother. So there's going to be a level of emotional connection there as well. But she seems to be the person who he trusts above all. She is the person who he trusts above all, but also, in entirely brutal terms, she is the person with power. She is consecrated queen. She's she's the actual Duchess of Aquitaine, Countess of Poitou. She rules the lands that they're actually in. But so far as England is concerned, she has been ruling there not as his regent. He never appointed her regent. She ruled as consecrated queen. And until there was a handover, she effectively had power both in England and in her own lands and was able to to be the natural authority figure until somebody else was acknowledged or staked a realistic claim. And of course, this to her must have been, oh, I suppose she's seen a lot of death over the years. She's seen a lot of death. By this stage, she has lost both of her daughters from her first marriage are dead. She has lost her very first son by Henry, William. She's lost Henry the Young King. She has lost Geoffrey of Brittany. She's lost her eldest daughter, Matilda, who married the Duke of Saxony. And there's a great moment of almost op- opposition here, where you have this small tent where the drama is playing out, set against what must have been an enormous empire, to, mm. in the eyes of the contemporaries at least. We can imagine that travel was a, a very slow and arduous undertaking at this time. But this is these are lands which stretch from what the south of France to the north of England. Yeah. And so what's happening in this tent is going to have repercussions right across. So she's got a head start, hasn't she? The the idea, the end game, if you like, is to ensure the succession to John. Well, let's see how this happens. So we're going to go a few months through the year to the 20th of July, 1199. We're in Tours, is that a correct pronunciation? What's going on? I'll let you pick this. Yes, this so so we're taking Eleanor outside of her land. She's got these vast lands and we're taking her and dropping her somewhere which is completely outside her, her territory. Okay. And she is performing homage to her former husband's son, uh, Philip Augustus, the King of France. Well, I think probably the first question, or just so you can describe it, what... What is the process of performing homage? What does it entail? So it effectively involves somebody probably on their knees, putting their hands between the hands of the person next up the line, in this case, the king, and offering to be their their man or their woman in Eleanor's case, and being offered the protection of the superior lord. And this is something which would traditionally happen on the accession of every new count or lord to their superior lord but it was so it's offering fealty almost. it's offering fealty that's yeah. exactly it but it's a highly highly unusual thing in this context eleanor had never performed homage to anybody before because as soon as she became duchess of aquitaine she was married to louis and he simply took over the duchy then she married henry and he performed such homage as was performed throughout their marriage and then Henry the Young King and Richard performed homage to the French kings. This is the first time Eleanor has ever performed homage. And it was also, it's also highly unusual in that you didn't normally get women performing homage because part of the equation, the offer to be somebody's man, has a military connotation. You're bringing your force to assist the needs of your superior lord. And a woman 
conventionally can't do that. As well, and a woman at the age of 65 as well. 75. For the fir- 75, sorry, wow, she's ageing quickly, but for the first time in her life as well. It seems to me a real insight into, we always have these books about leadership nowadays, mm. don't we? And it seems that she's giving us a bit of a lesson here because she's had this experience over the past 10 years in particular mm. where she's been involved in high politics and diplomacy and now she's bringing that experience to bear in a very loaded situation. Is that right? Absolutely. This picture of her performing homage is, in a sense, a deceptive one because it's the culmination of a very sophisticated operation that Eleanor performed after the death of Richard. Uh, John was, as I've said, a highly divisive character. I think I described him to you before we started talking. It was a bit like Brexit. (laughs) Uh, He literally divided families. So throughout Eleanor's lands, you'd you'd have families, half of whom would say, we'll go for John, and half of whom would say, we'll go for Arthur. And the only thing stopping them going for Arthur was Eleanor. So after she had put Richard in the ground, she performs an extensive tour of her lands, going round, finding out what's bothering people, giving people just as much as they need to ensure that they will declare for John, She gives communes to cities. She gives land to particularly difficult vassals. She travels with uh, Richard's favourite mercenary, Mercadier, just to let people know that if they don't do what she wants, there may be consequences. So you're mixtures of carrots and sticks. Yes. And then she finishes up going off out of her territory to Philip and doing homage herself so that she can be firmly established as the person who has the right which she can then give to John. It seems, yeah, as you say, it's the culmination of this process, which, and you wonder how much of this had formed in her head at the moment when she was in the tent with Richard and he was dying. Mm. But it's, this again requires energy, it requires insight. And she's really on a propaganda, to, well, not propaganda, it's like an electoral tour, isn't oh, yes. it? It's I mean, just it's, this it's, kind of thing. It's very, actually, it's very like an, an election campaign. I mean, without the, without the bus. But you can see the analogy in, you know, American politics and English politics. She is going around, she's looking at what bothers people locally, and she's promising exactly what they want locally to get the support for her candidate. And she manages to get that and to get to a position where Philip, having recognised her, she then technically cedes all her lands to John, which means that Philip has the obligation to protect John in the same way that he'd have an obligation to protect her. And John then gives her a life grant of the lands back. So she remains in control, but she has arranged that John has been formally acknowledged and Philip is technically bound to protect John. So it's a kind of an elaborate plan in a way, isn't mm. it? And this is, it's come off. Tell us a little bit about Philip Augustus, this man who is getting the homage. Because if we are picturing Eleanor there on her knees, hands raised mm. like this, not that you can quite see what I'm doing, but I've got my hands together yes. in a kind of homagey kind of way. Who's Philip Augustus? And why is he so important? So Philip Augustus is the... Um, son that her ex-husband Louis had finally succeeded in having. He is king of France, he is fanatically ambitious for France, and he is actually fanatically against the Angevin Empire. And he will make it his life's business to destroy, effectively, the empire which Eleanor and Henry had planned and built up. And basically, so this is a real foretaste of what's to come in a much more violent way with the Hundred Years' War. Is that right? Yes, but I mean, it is round the corner for John, um, and without a very sure hand on the tiller, which he wasn't. Which he wasn't. Mm. I think Eleanor must have must have had doubts by this stage whether whether John would be able to pull it off. Mm. But the alternative was Arthur of Brittany, who would simply be a puppet for Philip Augustus. So John at least had a chance of maintaining what she and Henry had put together. So can I ask you why she favoured John in the succession? If um, he was such a divisive character, 
and her support was really, really vital to his yeah. success in this succession. Is this something that you've thought about? Because would it be easier for her to support a puppet king that could be more easily controlled to then avoid the successive problems that we know happened? Well, I think there are a number of facets to it. Firstly, if she if she endorsed Arthur, then effectively her lands would be subsumed into the French Empire and Henry's lands would be subsumed into it. And that, that separate power base that they had worked so hard for, whether you call it an empire or not, would be gone. Secondly, she knew England very well. And Arthur of Brittany had had nothing to do with England, uh, whereas John had been brought up predominantly in England, had a lot of English support, actually. He was relatively well regarded by a lot of English barons at that point. At this moment. Yes, yeah, yeah. it all changes, obviously, so, but yeah. he, he actually had forged very useful bonds at an early stage. So he was the best ruler for England, in her view. John was intelligent, uh, and he had, he had lived in the household of Ranulph de Glanville, who had been the justiciar of England. And bottom line, John was her son. And, and there was there was, an affection between them that we can... Yeah. Yeah. It's often said that you know John's failings are put down to Eleanor being an absolutely terrible mother. But there is there seems to be reason to believe that she was very fond of him. She probably actually saw him as much as her other sons, possibly even more, because he was in England quite a lot when she was a captive. But certainly after she's released, twice she sticks her neck out to reconcile Richard and John. And that is given that she had a very good relationship with Richard. The fact that she actually goes the extra mile for John evidences, I think, uh, affection. Then we have letters from her to John in her very late years, which seem affectionate. And John, frankly, goes as far as he goes for anybody um, to assist Eleanor. In 1202, Eleanor is um, essentially uh, held in, in a siege at a place called Mirabeau, it looks like finally the whole Eleanor walking title deed thing is going to end with her being taken prisoner. But John actually rouses himself and has the only really great military victory of his career, saving Eleanor. So there's very, I think, very good grounds to Some really nice insight, isn't it? And yeah. maybe it's something that um, isn't always considered as much. I hadn't thought about that relationship in particular, but it's particularly nice to go back with such precision, really, to the 20th of July, 1199. Yeah. If we are considering this as a bit like a, an election campaign, for example, mm. often in election campaigns, things happen in the shadows that are highly influential that we don't see. It might be the uh, the winning of financial support or an influential backer comes over. It might be a dinner mm. somewhere. This seems to be um, out in the open, but just one of those moments, pivotal, really, yes. to something that's going to happen in England. Yes, and and it is, it's one of those moments that the significance of, I think, for a long time wasn't understood. Recent scholarship has really unpicked it. And you can, you can finally place it sort of between Eleanor um, indicating to the people she was in contact with that she favoured John and John's full assumption of power. It shows all the, all the efforts she went to to bring that about and just how committed she was to that outcome. And all of that is then just condensed into this wonderfully pictorial moment, yes. isn't it? Of um, Which is almost paradoxical because I mean, she's bending the knee. Yes. And maybe this again takes me back to this point I was making a, a few minutes ago, which if, if this is a study in power, she really has got the art of real politic, hasn't she? Because yes. she knows that sometimes you have yeah. to give a bit to get a lot. And it's it's a sort of... She's not too proud. To... No, but it, it's it's an ironic and deceptive moment as well because she's on her knees giving homage. But at the same time, politically, she's putting one over on Philip Augustus because she is putting him in the position where having pledged to protect her, he will then effectively be pledged to protect John, which is the last thing on earth he wants to do. Well, there's so much to consider there. It's a very trite point to think of a 75-year-old lady on her knees. She must have been, again, this is maybe yeah. another hint into it. And no there's more to come. <laughs> yeah, exactly. OK, well, let's move on to something slightly different. Uh, she was out of her ancestral lands there, but now she's back in the heart of it because th these territories for Eleanor really do sprawl. But if there's one heart to it all in these later years, it's this place 
um, which you'll pronounce for me. Fontrevo. Perfect. You've done it much better than me. <laughs> Late 1199, what's happening in our third scene that we want to go and have a look at? Yes. Eleanor is burying her youngest daughter. After she had given homage to Philip Augustus, she went and rendezvoused with John at Rouen. Also joining them at Rouen was Joanna. Now, Joanna had been sent off to marry the King of Sicily, aged about seven. That marriage had ended in her being widowed. She'd then been on crusade with Richard, uh, come back, been married to the Count of Toulouse. And that marriage had gone badly in the end. And she had fled from the lands of Toulouse, pregnant, She'd been in a fire, she'd been injured, and she ran to Richard and to her mother. Was she badly burnt at this point? It, it's unclear how serious the injury was. She certainly survived that, and she had gone to Fontrevaux, but towards the end of the year, she moved to be with Eleanor and John at Rouen. She'd got no money from her husband, so Eleanor arranged just for John to essentially fund her. But poor Joanna goes into labour in September at Rouen, and it's a breach presentation. After being in labour for a very, very long period of time, it's clear that she is not going to make it. And she says that the one thing she wants is to become veiled as a nun at Fontrebeau, which was impossible because she was married and she was pregnant. And those are two things that do not go with becoming a nun. Uh, but she begged her mother, and her mother begged the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Archbishop of Canterbury said, you know, it's just not possible. And Eleanor said to him, well, think again. Um, and she put so much pressure on him and the church hierarchy that entirely contrary to all precedent, poor Joanna has the comfort of being veiled as a nun of Fontrevaux before her death. So she and the baby die and Eleanor takes the body of her youngest daughter back across the country to Fontrevaux uh, where she buries her. Again, Eleanor, 75, coming up 76. You might think that she just stay there, but no, she's off again instantly because Joanna has given her her will. And as Eleanor goes down to Toulouse to see Joanna's husband, the Count of Toulouse, give him the will and ensure that he executes Joanna's last wishes before finally going back to Fontrevaux, where she could plan the images of Henry, the images of Richard, her own image, and Joanna's tomb. So, well, blimey, sorry, you've picked some incredible scenes here, and this one is um, our, our second deathbed scene, I suppose, in a way, because this is Joanna, and maybe we should um, count the baby that did live long enough to be baptised, I Yes, think, he was baptised Richard. Richard. Yeah, so that's our second Richard, which um, we should maybe note as well in the conversation. I mean, I'll ask you what is the, the underlying attractions of the scene in a moment, but one of my observations would be that it's very interesting to see her in this moment of challenging the church in the process of, of this, and it takes everyone back to that moment because one of the great episodes of Eleanor's life that we haven't mentioned is with Thomas a Beckett in Canterbury 20, 30 years before that famous kind of showdown between the King and the Archbishop of Canterbury. We all know how that ended. Mm. But this is one of the major dynamics in this time, isn't it? This, mm. this fault line between religion and secular power, I suppose. And it's really interesting as a footnote just to see her challenging again. Challenging, but challenging on the basis of a very strong relationship with the church. Um, throughout her life, Eleanor was close to churchmen. So in her childhood, the Archbishop of Bordeaux, in her first years in England, the then Archbishop of Canterbury. And then sort of throughout her life, at each point, you could pick a churchman to whom she was close. At this point in Fontrevaux, there was somebody called Abbot Luke of Turpinay, who supported her throughout Richard's death. She's close to Hubert Walter, whose candidacy for the Archbishop of Canterbury she supported. So Walter, in a sense, in the end, helped her to get what she wanted of the situation. But for me, the real meat of this scene is pointing up Eleanor as close to her daughters. Her relationship with her daughters has been, I think, long neglected because they aren't headlining. But you can see that when Joanna was in trouble, she turned to her mother. She ran to her mother. She gave her mother her will and said, please make sure my will is executed. She wasn't the only one of Eleanor's daughters who came to her. When her daughter Matilda of Saxony was exiled from Saxony and Eleanor was in prison, 
uh, Matilda went to her and bore her final child with Eleanor. Um, what still remains that we haven't quite got to is a couple of years later, Eleanor is to visit Castile where her um, eldest surviving daughter, named after her Eleanor, is Queen of Castile. And there she will choose from amongst Eleanor's daughters, the future Queen of France to be married to Philip Augustus's son. Um, and she spent months with her daughter there. At Fontrevaux, she is living in a society where the granddaughter by her youngest daughter by Louis is living alongside her and is named in one of her charters as her ward. Um, visiting her at the time of Richard's death, another of her granddaughters, Mathilde, the daughter of Matilda. So you can see Eleanor caring for her daughter and accompanying her on her final journey. But there's this kind of penumbra of all the other strong female relationships she built with her daughters, with her grandchildren. Is the more recent scholarship on these relationships at the moment, have they come into focus yet? Well, I'm hoping that they are going to. Um, it's something on, to which I've given a bit more focus, I think, in my book than has previously been done. Eleanor suffers so many losses through her life that it would just be so easy to say fine and do nothing. But always, what, when there is a challenge, she is there dealing with it and dealing with it in a constructive and practical way. And however great the losses, she always seems to be not only doing her duty, but with affection to give to the people around her. And I find that very striking. It is really striking. And I, this is something I don't know um, enough about, so I'll catch it before I, I say it. But in, in terms of contemporary conceptions of gender at the time, women, were they expected to be more emotional than men? Because she seems to be acting here in very pragmatic, practical terms. You know, something's gone wrong. What are we going to do to fix it? How are we going to get from A to B? You have this desire, you have this will, you want to put it into um, into practice. Th these are the things that she's doing, and none of them seem to me... Well, I mean, the church would say that women were just sort of seething masses of emotion, but the political setup of um, the way people organised their property always assumed that women, once they were widows, would exercise power, would look after property. That's what um, underpinned the concept of dower. So it's not... I suppose those are older women, so maybe the church would see them as less seething bundles of emotion. So it's not actually um, completely unusual, but the scale on which she does it and the level of challenges that she faces are extraordinary. Extraordinary. And one of the real points of interest in your book is showing actually that you can... I suppose treat her as an extraordinary character but then actually you should look at her with a cool eye as well and see where she came from because there was traditions in the south of France in particular for strong women with yeah. power and with wealth who inherited and that's really the seedbed of the culture that she came out of isn't it okay well it's been an absolute pleasure talking all the way through this history we always ask the same question of every single one of our guests towards the end 1199 is a is a year with so much that happened in it. Lots of tangible objects that uh, bounced around that year too. If you could have one of them in this nice part of London, we're looking out over the courts of justice or whatever, at the moment, what would you like? Would you like to bring one object back with you? So I can't be absolutely certain that this is something that Eleanor had with her, but I think she would have had something similar. Um, in the book, I've got a picture of a ring that she gave to a monk of St Albans. Uh, Richard Animal, who was a schoolmate of hers. It's a little gold ring with a, um, with a uh, sapphire inset into the band. And it's got R and A on each side, which could be Richard Animal and it could be Regina Alianora. And I suspect that this is the kind of thing that she carried a lot of to give as gifts to people. These little bands with a jewel in with R A on it. I'd like that, please. Wow. Something that could just, you know, you could just glance down at. Mm. And it'd probably give you a bit of a shot of energy if we know anything Absolutely. about uh, Eleanor. This chapter in your book that covers the period of 1199, I think it's called 
the matriarch. And I think that's how I'm going to remember Eleanor after our conversation, because, you know, there's lots of ways that you see her depicted in in our culture today as a feminist icon, as a, I don't know, a great seductress or whatever else. But it's just that idea of her being the person that you turn to when things have gone bad. Richard did, John did, and then Joanna later on. Yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Good luck with the book. Thank you thank very, very much. much. It's been so lovely. A remarkable woman indeed. That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Sarah Cockrell about her book, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Queen of France and England, Mother of Empires. It was published in hardback just last month and with a week to go till Christmas. I think you've got about enough time to have it wrapped up under the tree if you were enticed. It's really recommended by us. If you want to learn more about the context of this time, the 12th century world, or about Eleanor herself, then please do check out our episode specific page. That's historytoday.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find some show notes alongside links to articles written by experts from the archives of the world's leading serious history magazine. Please do check that out. We'll be back at Travels Through Time with more adventures into the past very soon. So please do subscribe to our feed to get the first news of new episodes. That leaves me with pretty much nothing more to say than thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And one last thing too, a very Merry Christmas to you. Goodbye.